So welcome to this edition of the ZK Study Club. Um, today we are going to be hearing from Tarun, who is the sometimes co-host of the ZK Podcast, and he's going to be talking about the differential privacy and constant function market makers. And the two other co-authors, Alex and Guillermo, are here and will hopefully be jumping in with some ideas and answering questions in the chat. All right. So Tarun, do you want to take it away? Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. So uh, yeah, this talk is going to be about um, differential privacy, which you know is a, a weaker form of privacy um, than you know one normally ha looks at uh, in the ZK world. Um, but it, you know, does provide some level of uh, some guarantees for users uh, that they won't get front run or the probability of them getting front run is somewhat lower. Um, and, you know, we'll go through kind of the background on how these things are defined, uh, also what differential privacy is, um, and then kind of give the rough techniques used. Um, the implementation of this actually is not, shouldn't be too terrible on a blockchain with verifiable randomness. Um, but yeah, we'll, let's start with some background. All right, so before uh, kind of jumping into kind of the definitions, I think sometimes it's a good idea to look at history. Um, so, you know, let's just start at the very basics. Uh, so there's a lot of scenarios where, uh, you know, we, one really wants to trade assets, uh, which, you know, sort of is, is a basic uh, uh, goal. Uh, and the traditional way of doing this is, you know, there are multiple parties. Uh, some parties uh, say they want to buy at a certain price. Some parties say they want to sell at a certain price. Uh, buyers, sort of post maximum prices that they're willing to buy for, sellers post minimum prices they're willing to sell at, um, and trades occur when um, the max is greater than the min. Seems pretty simple. But one interesting thing is if you actually try to analyze this from the lens of wanting to decentralize it, it's actually a lot harder than you might think uh, because a lot of the operations are non-atomic um, and you end up trusting a third party to keep track of the sort of outstanding buys and sells. Um, moreover, this sort of has this linear space requirement. So you need to, if there are n orders, uh, you need to store O of n space, something O of n, with O of n space. Um, and uh, that linear update is, is kind of chaotic on a blockchain. In, because in the worst case scenario, you know, people will front run you and it will be uh, quite unstable. And in fact, um, you know, in Solana this week, there was a liveness fault for seven hours. And at the end of the liveness fault, um, there was this kind of massive set of liquidations that occurred because they were do using an order book on chain. And order books are not very good under network partitions because market makers have to go adjust their quotes. So if there's a network partition for too long, they can't actually interact with the blockchain anymore. Um, so this linear space thing actually for blockchains is quite uh, bad. And we've seen many examples of it fail, not just Solana, Ether, Delta in the past, other, other things like that. Um, one other thing is uh, order books are kind of annoying in the sense that uh, prices might update kind of slowly if the buyers are buying very small size relative to what the sellers are selling. Um, and it can, it can kind of, the dynamics of that can, can be unfavorable in certain cases. And then you also have to add subsidies for market makers. So one question is, can you automate the process of building an order book and, and having sort of people quoting prices? Um, and so, yes, there, you know, for the last, 30 years, there has been sort of study on automated market makers. And the idea is you can't get sort of a perfect automated market maker. Uh, there's sort of some natural adverse selection reasons for why not. Uh, but you try to get one that meets some certain criteria and desert data that you're looking for, such as bounded loss, like the most amount of loss that a liquidity provider will take is bounded in some sense, in some parameters. Um, liquidity sensitivity, the idea that for a fixed size trade, um, prices move less when there's more liquidity provided. 
and small storage requirements. So this gets back to this linear space piece, which you know in production we have just observed that um, very few order book like traditional order book style uh, mechanisms uh, seem to ever be popular and or survive on blockchains without you know massive subsidies like we see on Solana. But automated market makers are a very old idea. Um, actually starts in the statistical literature in the 1970s uh, with Savage, uh, who actually kind of invented the logarithmic market scoring rule. He just called it something different. But it was really popularized by Hansen, Robin Hansen in 2002. Um, and there's sort of a simple idea, which is you have a formula that's a function of liquidity deposited. So that's quantities of different assets that are deposited. Um, and liquidity providers pool these assets into a, a contract and the contract uh, price of the asset with this deterministic formula. Um, and if the price is too low relative to an external market, an agent can purchase from the contract and sell it externally. If the price is too high, the agent can buy externally and sell to this contract. And um, you know there are a bunch of different security guarantees depending on the formula. But the idea is that the amount of liquidity, the quantity of liquidity deposited implicitly uh, implies a price. Um, and the relative proportion of the different assets sort of gives you an idea of what that price is. So if there's less of asset A than asset B, uh, asset A is more scarce. And so hence its price should be higher than that asset B. So the simplest example is a fixed price at all reserve amounts. Now, that's not necessarily bad, uh, but it, it is sort of, you know, you're, you're publicly offering a fixed price. Uh, and if there's any external market that has a different price, um, you know, there'll be arbitrage and, and the reserve will be left with the worst asset. So one thing to remember in these automated market makers, one of the reasons you care about this bounded loss property is let's suppose I have an automated market maker uh, with Ethereum and USD, some USD stable coins, sorry. Uh, and you know the Ethereum's price is going up. Arbitrageurs are noticing the price is lower on the automated market maker and higher externally. So they buy ETH from the automated market maker and sell it externally. But they buy ETH by selling USD to the market maker. So they're kind of giving the crappier asset to the automated market maker. And so you need to add fees to kind of balance that effect out, um, which is why the sort of fixed price thing can oftentimes be bad, unless it's something that's supposed to really be a fixed price, like two stable coins. Um, another example uh, is the ratio of two assets, um, the ratio of the quantities. So like, let's say there's $100 and one Ethereum, then the ratio says the price of, of Ethereum is $100. Um, and that captures the scarcity property correctly. And this is, this is Uniswap. Um, Cool. So now we're ready to actually talk about the formal definition of these objects uh, in, in um, sort of more generality. Um, so a constant function market maker uh, is a contract that has n assets, each with reserves ri. So the reserves are the quantity of assets liquidity deposited. Um, liquidity providers, so people who want to provide liquidity and have the potential to earn fees, but really they're, they're sort of providing a service to the contract that facilitates trading, um, can supply these reserves. And traders are allowed to add or remove coins, provided that they preserve uh, an invariant um, called the trading function, phi. Uh, and phi is without the loss of generality, concave and non-increasing, um, you might say, hey, concave, x, y equals k is not concave. However, you can always do a monotonic transformation by taking the square root uh, and you get the same curve. So slight technical detail, but with, for, without, you can sort of think of these things in, as concave and non-increasing. Um, the super level sets of this function determine sort of admissible trades. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at some pictures in a second. Um, and you know the most popular is, is Uniswap. So 
you know, just to give a somewhat practical look at these assets or these, uh, this mechanism, um, you know, it's the most used decentralized application period. Uh, there's like $3 billion a day traded on these. Um, the second most is of course lending, but uh, you know, it is clearly the thing that people want to use um, in, in sort of decentralized land. It, it's, it is the only application I would say that has truly kind of like hit mass adoption. Okay, so, so let's think about this trading set just in pictures so you get some intuition. So this is the Uniswap curve. So X, you know, RA times RB equals a constant. That is a parabola that you see drawn here, hyperbola really. And you can see the trading set above. And so the trading set, the super level set uh, is convex. Um, and the boundary, any, cur any point on the boundary, the darker shaded points are uh, viable trades under no arbitrage. Um, and one thing, you know, I think that we realized when we started analyzing these things is that it's actually much easier to analyze the super level sets than just the boundary. Um, and so it, it turns out this still, the, these trades are still feasible. It's just that if you were a rational trader and you made a trade that moved the state of the system to an interior point, um, you would immediately lose money under no arbitrage. Uh, so no one would actually use them, but it turns out the geometry of these sets uh, is kind of very crucial to ensuring that these uh, systems can't be manipulated in some way. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of the main object. And you might say, ah, oh, who cares? Why do we need convexity? Well, let's just, look at it visually, suppose I, you know, take a bite out of the trading set. Uh, now I get two prices for with, so remember it's sort of the, the slope uh, of this, uh, these lines sort of the tangent line is rough is the price. Uh, but now I have two uh, sort of different trades at different prices and you, there's kind of no difference uh, between this curve and the one that fills in the hole. Um, and so basically if, if there is a hole like this, you can kind of show under no arbitrage, like people will just basically fit, you'll effectively have constant trading while you're inside the, the missing piece because of this kind of property that you have multiple, uh, reserve values, like you the same price. Um, I will just, I saw there were some questions maybe. Uh, or right, sorry, yeah. Guillermo was giving some context actually. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Uh, thanks Guillermo for answering uh, questions. Um, okay, so, you know, we talked about this trading set uh, that has the shape and it has sort of a boundary. Um, there's sort of this natural intuition that somehow the curvature, how flat or uh, bent the, the, the shape is, controls price impact. So um, before we go into the definitions, let's just take the empirical data on this. So curve um, is a uh, automated market maker, uh, probably second most popular after Uniswap. And it's just a, a linear combination of the constant sum, which is a fixed price and the uh, Uniswap curve. Curve has this property that near a certain point, it's extremely flat. And at that, when it's very flat, that basically means you can trade arbitrarily large, a very large size and cause very little price impact. So in some sense, the flatter you are, the larger the trade, trade you can make without causing more than a price change of a certain amount. Um, and why this is important is for assets that tend to be the same price. So trading two stable coins, USDC against USDT, you want uh, you you don't want people to be able to cause the price to go up easily because it effectively a lot makes it a bad oracle and it's sort of much more manipulable. So there's a sense in which the shape of these uh, curves should somehow reflect the expected trading behavior 
of the assets as stochastic processes. So the question is, can we formalize that? And so you might naturally say, hey, I took calculus. Don't you just take the Hessian? Don't you just take the gradient? Don't you take, just take the eigenvalues of the Hessian? Then you get sort of a notion of curvature. That is true. Um, it turns out to be a little more nuanced uh, in these constant function market makers because when we have this constant constraint, we have an implicit function. OK, so what we do is we define a function called the price impact function. The price impact function comes from these sort of implied constraints. And the price impact function is defined as the ratio um, of the derivative uh, of the trading function um, and of, of the two partial derivatives of the trading function. And the idea is that given a trade of size delta, I compute uh, you know, the, the change to the trading function value and then I look at the gradients in each direction. So we're just pretend we're only going to talk about two dimensions, like trading one asset for another in this talk. You can generalize this to n assets. It does get a lot more complicated. Um, so for simplicity, we'll stick to the two asset case. So you know, remember how we how in in the previous picture, in the picture here, the price implied is the slope of this line, right? And the slope of this line is actually, you know, the ratio of a, a, a derivative in one direction to the ratio of a derivative in another direction, because this function is defined by the constraint psi of xy equals constant. And so this is encoding the exact same thing, except for arbitrary uh, trading functions. Um, you can intuitively, from an economic standpoint, think of uh, g of delta as the price impact uh, after a trade of size delta. So imagine we're initially at a price of dollar, G of delta is equal to 20 cents. Then that sort of says, when, when I make a trade of size 100, that says that, you know, the price is now $1.20. Um, and the, the notion of curvature that we use here is actually uh, basically bounds on changes uh, of the function that are sort of Lipschitz style bounds, so an upper bound and a lower bound. The upper bound is called mu stability. That basically says, uh, basically, given a trade of size delta, um, you get at most mu times delta price impact. And we say G is kappa liquid if uh, you have a lower bound. Um, and the lower bound. Uh, sort of represents this idea that when you make a trade, you have to change the price at least a certain amount. And so in the constant sum case that we were talking about earlier, uh, mu and kappa are zero because it's a constant price. There's no price impact. I can trade whatever size until the reserves are exhausted um, and the price doesn't change. But for something like Uniswap, it actually has quite a large kappa. So even tiny trades do have some price impact. And this is important in privacy uh, as, as we'll sort of see, uh, because you you can kind of infer what the trades are based on the price changes. And that's that's where uh, this gets more complicated. Oh, well, uh, I think I messed up this slide, but basically the main things I was gonna mention here is uh, this, this curvature, you know, uh, can be used to sort of prove properties of what happens when uh, one of these constant function market makers is the dominant market. Um, and it turns out that some, an analog of sort of a condition number from numerical analysis, so like the ratio of the biggest to smallest uh, absolute values of eigenvalues of Hessian controls sort of how synchronized these markets stay if they're two constant function market makers um, and our treasurers are trading between them. Okay, now we can finally get to privacy. So one question is, can we just achieve privacy in CFMMs uh, by just posting uh, sort of ZK commitments of reserves and basically evaluating the trading function invariant uh, privately. Uh, and you know, under a relatively simple threat model, you can sort of show that that's not true. An adversary only needs to know the reserves at one time and then the sequence of prices to in infer all of the trade sizes. Um, this result 
sort of is an impossible sort of impossibility result style thing that just basically says you can't just take Uniswap, throw it in ZK and hope that you have made it private because you're still leaking information because prices have to be public. No one is going to sort of use your automated market maker if it can't quote public prices, but those public prices tell you a lot about the trade sizes. So there's only really two ways of avoiding this. Um, the first is batching. Uh, so that's take 10 transactions, treat them as one transaction, execute, and then give everyone the same price. Uh, the second is randomizing prices, so adding noise to people's orders or trade sizes or adding noise to their prices. Uh, and basically like in, enough noise that an uh, adversary can't really predict the price more than sort of some notion of entropy of the noise. Batching is not very great. Uh, UX wise, unless all the trades are kind of small. And randomizing prices is also not great because you're changing the price impact uh, of, the, uh, of the, the function. But okay, if we assume that these are the only two things we can do, how, how do we actually achieve some, some notion of, of privacy? Uh, well, just as a simple kind of straw man example, suppose we just added IID uh, Gaussian noise to all the prices, that wouldn't work very well because I, I could just basically try to learn what your noise parameters are, denoise the prices, and then invert via kind of the previous model. Um, and so that leads us to the case of, hey, actually, we need to spend some time thinking about what types of adversaries uh, are here. And, and I think this gets to uh, to Alistair's question somewhat. Um, do you want to do you want to say some of these questions? I don't know if you want to mention them. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I can ask. I'm not sure which ones Guillermo's going. I'm not sure which oh. ones Guillermo's going to answer. So I, I can. <laughs> Maybe um, Al. So Alistair's question is. So yeah, I'm I'm just wondering yeah what the model is here who who's keeping private from whom so if you're talking about zk proofs you would you would assume that someone knows something and it's just the chain that's it's being hidden from so say we have a centralized entity who's doing all the trades. Uh, what is your... yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, the idea is the the model here is is strictly the the things an adversary knows and we'll kind of get to this in a second are only that a and ignore they they might not know they might not be a validator they might not have mempool data they might not have any address data the only things we assume the adversary knows are the reserve values um, and the prices and they can query whether a trade is valid or not so uh, they can basically learn the geometry of that trading set that but only locally they can't learn the whole thing at once in some ways and they know the trading function. So, so what I was asking was kind of the, the other question, which is the, the, the positive question. Someone has to know this in order to make transactions. Um, yes. So who, who, who are you assuming does know this or are we just assuming we're uh, going to implement it somehow? Yeah, yeah. Asking I, what's I, the best possible? A, yeah, yeah. Assume it gets, it gets implemented somehow. I mean, right now, right, if we think about how NEV auctions work, uh, basically, only a small subset of validators even see the uh, see these trades before they get executed. So there is some notion of like a small group of validators of the layer one kind of know the trades. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it, it there is someone who has to know, and that comes down to how uh, the layer one actually executes transactions. Yeah, I can hop in for like one sec. So essentially, the the, the idea is that you can in, in our case we don't even assume that anyone actually knows the information so like you could imagine that if even if you could create a system that had perfect privacy around the information right around anyone not knowing the reserve amounts you're still fine um or you're still sorry not fine that's the impossibility result is that you even if like you know the person who knew the reserve amounts was super trusted and everything right using only just the information from the prices uh you can already invert that like you can already like uh, infer the actual reserve amounts. That's the impossibility result. So even in the very strong case where, you know, this whole setup is like super trusted and super secure, you're still screwed. Does that make sense? 
Right. So we're, so we're sort of first, we're trying to secure this in the case where we actually would have a trusted entity that's doing all the trades. And then maybe once you've gotten that, you, you'd think about how to do this in a more decentralized way. Right. You, 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 can, you can use it as your, as your like best possible model if, you, if you'd like. Um, but, but the point is that the result kind of holds independent of the implementation. Um, there was, I don't know if the question's fully answered there, but there was another question just above Al's, and I don't yes. know if we should also ask this. This so, is Alfonso's uh, question. Alfonso, oh, sorry. Uh, Can't you infer no. about a trade just by looking at the change in liquidity pool sizes, even if there's- Right, zero right, right. Yeah, so this is the part I was saying where, where there were, <clears throat> part of the reason we wrote the first paper was there were a lot of like people writing or, or writing both code and white papers <clears throat> saying that they were basically going to make Uniswap uh, run in SGX or have a ZK commitment where they hide the reserves. So the reserve prices would have been hidden. So that's why in our adversarial model, we don't assume that the uh, the adversary can know the reserves publicly. So there's somehow only commitments of them posted. Um, and so that was the part that even if that's true, you can still figure out the reserves uh, from the prices effectively. Um, cool. Uh, so. Uh, so the, um, shall I ask my question as well? Um, so my question was, um, it's a, suppose um, you have a, a perfect anonymity um, network and all of the addresses um, of the participants are private. Um, we, we basically know how to do that. Um, and so you only know the, um, the amounts of trades. How, how bad is that? How much, um, in practice, how much? Uh, information does that give you that would allow you to infer stuff about the the actual participants? It's not even necessary that you want to infer things about the participant. It's that you can front run them and you can like basically, right. you can basically force, like for instance, let's suppose there's a trade that's about to cause a big liquidation on another protocol. Uh, and you can basically ensure that that trade gets executed first, causes the liquidation and then the price goes back up, right? So that type of at, and that's the type of stuff we see in practice. I, people don't care about the identities that much, they, but they do care about kind of causing harm in other ways. Okay. If that makes sense. It can also be quite bad for privacy directly, right? If I know, for instance, that a user has transferred a hundred bucks from their Coinbase account, and then I know there's also a trade for some asset for a hundred, then uh, I know a lot of information about that user and I can correlate it potentially to a real world identity as well. Depending. So it depends on the model of what external information the attacker has uh, at their disposal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and we'll, we'll, when we get to differential privacy definition, we'll, we'll talk a little about, I'll try to give some um, in, in, inclination as to why this, that definition is natural, uh, because it's sort of, it's the best you can do if you assume that someone can join arbitrary data against your, um, uh, your existing data set. Cool. So any mechanism we choose here, the impossibility result says the following. There's always a trade-off between price impact. So, you know, the user says they want to do a trade of size five, which in the not fully non-private version might only cause 20 cents of price impact. Uh, but, you know, the impossibility result says you have to add some noise or batch. So that will change that versus privacy, sort of the precision in, in a sense of the number of bits that an adversary and apologies, this is the super villain emoji in LaTeX. I, it does not look like the other super villain emoji uh, normally, uh, but I have to save space. I wanted to use the emoji uh, it, it, that an adversary can estimate the trade size up to. So batching. So there's kind of two extremes. Yeah, exactly. I was hoping it would look like that, but unfortunately it did not. Uh, but batching, uh, is, uh, good for privacy because if I batch all these trades, you can't figure out which one is which, and you only see one posted transaction in some sense, uh, but it's terrible for price impact. And so the simplest worst case example is let's suppose we have T trades where T minus one trades are of size one. 
and one trait is of size t. Um, if the CFMM is kappa liquid, this gives a lower bound of omega of t, so like uh, of in price impact. Um, and in some sense, this means that the batched transaction, so when I made a trade of size one, I only had O of one price impact. But when I get batched, I actually have O of T price impact now, where T is the batch size, um, which is way worse, right? That's, that's just like from an from a, a, a economic fairness standpoint, it kind of sucks. Um, on the other hand, normal CFMM evaluation Terrible for privacy, good for price impact. You, everyone knows what price impact is. It's public and computable efficiently. So our goal is actually to think about this trade-off surface between how much price impact we cause versus how many bits of information an adversary can extract uh, and try to parameterize that space in between these two extremes, between the batch case, which is terrible price impact, but provides privacy versus the raw case that isn't. So now we get to the adversarial model. So we sort of assume the simple but general model, uh, which has the following, uh, where the adversary has the following state and queries. So the state they have is at some point in time, maybe it's just like the creation of the pool, they know the reserves. Um, and so there's sort of a sense in which it's very hard to construct a CFM where you completely hide the reserve values at all time because pool creation somehow has to leak some information about that. Um, but we assume that, that, that they can figure out exactly one time. They don't need to know at any other time. Um, the uh, other thing they know is the marginal price. So they can compute the marginal price of CFMM at all its current reserves. And remember the marginal price is a, a derivative. So it's taking that trading set on the boundary and we're computing the gradient locally at whatever point we're at. Um, is valid uh, basically says is a, a Boolean classifier that says, are we in the trading set or not? Okay, so this is how much, so the idea is that the, the adversary can locally search the geometry of that set by these queries and tries to, tries to infer the exact path that was taken. And note that we do not explicitly assume they know any identifying information of any form. Could be hidden by CKPs, could be hidden in, 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 in a trusted manner, whatever. So, so just to clarify, they know whether it's instantaneously valid at the current price, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's kind of consider uh, adaptive adversaries. So adversaries who they see some sub subsequence of trades and they try to adapt what their guess of where the whale trade is. So the simplest example, again, gets back to this, this bad batching example, um, which is, uh, you know, the, the trade of size T in the batch is look we'll, for simplicity called that the whale, that's the whale trade making a big trade. And all the trades of size one are the minnows or whatever, I don't know, random other people. Um, so the adversary, their goal is to front run the whale. So they want to push the price up in front of the whale, sell back right after, um, which is also called a sandwich attack, except this would be sort of a slightly more generalized one that'd be probabilistic. Uh, and so the, how would an adversary do this? Well, from a sort of learning theory uh, standpoint, one way of viewing this is assume the adversary can construct T Boolean functions, which take the prices. So that's what the zero to infinity in the domain is. Uh, so they take the first I prices and return the Boolean of whether the whale is in the first I trades or not. Um, without going into any details on classical school learning theory, uh, you can show that if the adversary has any edge over a coin flip, um, you can use boosting style methods to improve the learner to the point that it has very high probability. Uh, just kind of the, is the vector, yes, 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 yes. Assume they're all in one direction. Sorry, oh, yes, that's a very wanna, good point. You wanna um, say in it, Tarun? Yes. We, should, we should say that out loud. So maybe, or Henry, yes. I don't know if Henry wants oh, to. Yeah. 
Jet, the, the, it says the jet question is what the, okay. the the vector one up to t and then one is that, that that's a vector of uh, you know m different trades that are all specified just by you know here's what happens on input whatever or the first input yeah sorry yes 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 uh so very good point so assuming we're assuming two assets uh and trade when the trade is positive it's asset a for b and when the trade is negative it's b for a uh, and they're assumed to be valid. So they all are in the trading set. So these are all valid trades that can be made. Um, but this worst case is all trades in the same direction. So that's actually a very good point. Um, and you're just trying to identify the whale. Um, yeah, so, so classical learning theory uh, kind of says, hey, look, if, if an adversary can do a little better than a coin flip, they can actually do these ensemble methods and like, you know, if you've ever heard of gradient boosted trees, the theory of why they work is this type of stuff. Uh, and so this basically says, oh, a, an adaptive, you know, uh, for some reason, cryptography, everyone says adaptive adversary. And in, you know, the private machine learning world, everyone says online learning adversary, but I'm using them interchangeably because as far as I know, they're roughly equivalent, but this is, this is sort of a, this is kind of what, uh, these are kind of the results from more like the private machine learning um, world. Um, but the idea is, um, you know, control of how price noise affects the probability of these classifiers being correct impacts the adversary's success. So for instance, randomly permuting the trades decreases gamma if the adversary has no ability to predict the random permutation. And this is where the verifiable random function uh, and non-predictability guarantees are extremely important. The problem is online learning is extremely intuitive, right? That description of this adversary who's like kind of learning these classifiers and then figuring out uh, has some probability of the classifiers being correct. Extremely intuitive, kind of easy, uh, but it's extremely hard from an analysis standpoint. So it's extremely high dimensional. Uh, and there's not much extra structure you can really exploit. Moreover, the set of classifiers you choose is dependent on the instance, right? Here, I had to say the attack is there is a whale trade that needs, we want to identify, and we want to make Boolean classifiers that identify that and then talk about the probability of identification. But the problem is there might be other types of attacks, and so if, if you kind of study things like you know, minor effectual value in general, it, you know, you would have to basically enumerate all of those scenarios and that sucks. Um, however, and I think this is one of the greatest results in the last two years. And I think the pandemic maybe hid that this kind of research happened, um, but there's kind of this, you know, I'd call pretty groundbreaking work that shows that like the set of, algorithms that are online learnable is also the same as the set of algorithms that can be made differentially private. Um, and that sort of says this sort of worst case bound over all Boolean classifiers is somehow captured by this notion of differential privacy, which we'll talk about next. Um, and this says that, you know, we can kind of use this to our advantage to say, hey, if we can construct a differentially private version of a CFMM, uh, then we kind of get these online learning adversary guarantees. And that's how I got to this result, but it, you know, it kind of came backwards because I was trying for a long time to sol solve it using online learning methods and it was just not going anywhere. Cool. So what is differential privacy? So now we've, we're kind of at the, at the uh, point of, of thinking about this. So privacy uh, comes in many shapes and sizes. So of course, this is the ZK study club. So zero knowledge proofs, computational proofs, cheaply verified, very hard to do on learning algorithms. Uh, you know, I, I obviously people in this audience are much better experts than me of knowing the exact complexity of that right now, but uh, I still haven't seen, you know, like, a, a learning algorithm, kind of like one that would be trying to learn these trades, be 
able to, to be implemented. Um, but, you know, of course, has this Moore's law happening. So maybe that will one day will be sufficient. But for these kind of learning things, I think it's actually still a little tricky. Uh, homomorphic encryption, too hard, hard in a lot of ways, hard, far from production. Uh, too many weird algebraic properties need to be hold, et cetera, whatever. And then now we get to differential privacy. So differential privacy is the weakest notion of all three of these, but it's also the most used. Um, so what the intuitive idea is you add a bunch of noise to your data such that, um, such that uh, I can still compute an average correctly, but I can't identify any single user. So a simple example, let's take the heights of people in whatever city you live in. And let's say we want to compute the average height. Um, and the, uh, you know, let's say there's one person who's seven feet tall, which uh, seems anomalously high. Um, and they, you know, but you want to compute the average and let's say the average is actually like five foot 11. Uh, the person who has seven, the seven foot average, if, if say I remove them versus add them, the average might change from five foot 11 to five foot six. Um, and now I can identify that they were removed from the data set, right? So one way of preserving say this average is to add noise to everyone's height such that the average is preserved. So it's like mean zero noise. But if I remove any person, I can't identify uh, them from that, the change in, in the average, which is exactly what we're doing here, which is we're looking at changes in price and trying to identify the trade sizes sort of. And it's what is easiest to use for very hard learning algorithms. Um, and the complexity of the privacy mechanism is much less than the complexity of the algorithm. So, one thing I think that at least seems empirically true about CKPs is that the complexity of generating a circuit and correctly you know, setting it up can oftentimes dwarf the complexity of the algorithm that the circuit is evaluating. Um, and in differential privacy, it's the opposite. The privacy mechanism is usually just, I want to sample random numbers, I noise my data, and it needs to be, it might be sensitive to what the data is. And then that's it. And the idea is it's meant to be safe under interactive usage. So uh, if basically I, so, so a famous example that led to the definitions we're going to see on the next slide is the Netflix prize. So um, I don't know if you remember the Netflix prize, which was like, you know, Netflix was, gave this million dollar prize for um, optim figuring out the best recommendations. So they gave you sort of this huge sparse matrix where the rows represent uh, users, anonymized, uh, and the columns represented movies. And if there was an entry in the matrix, it would represent someone's ranking from one to five. And people famously showed that you could use data external to Netflix, join it with the Netflix data set, uh, and de-anonymize with like very high probability, like 95% identification of like certain users. Um, and so the idea of, of, of this definition is really so that, hey, if someone has another data set that they join, they can't do that much better than like the noise level that's added. Um, and it's used in practice at Apple, Google, the US Census uses it this year. I think people were complaining a little bit about it this year because I think so social scientists didn't realize their data had noise added to it, but say la vie. Uh, cool. So if we, if we get back to, to the definition, um, sort of this thing I was saying earlier is I have a data set and consider a, a nearby data set, a data set where I remove one person's data. So this is the, in this diagram, XN would, would be the seven foot, um, outlier height person. And F the function computed is the average, the mean. Um, and 
if we're good at being differentially private, the adversary can't tell with a high probability like which data set has the anomalous person removed or cut. So, so we assume okay. that we assume that the adversary knows the height of that person or uh, no, we assume they don't know the height. They only know the averages, but they've they've seen the averages under two different circumstances. And oh, they, so the, in, they in, don't in, know that there exists a, a person of anomalous height that was removed or added. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, and so, an, an a randomized algorithm is is epsilon delta differentially private. Um, well, I put measurable in the wrong place. Measurable should be in front of S. But if for all X and X prime uh, in the domain of the algorithm with the X and X prime being at distance less than or equal to one. So the intuition for that is in the database, if I use handing distance, distance equal one is remover add entry. Mm -hmm. uh, and for any S in the output, any measurable S in the output, the measurable is because I'm taking this probability. Uh, I satisfy this condition, which is the probability that a of x is in the set is less than or equal to e to the epsilon plus delta. And another way to write that, if delta is equal to zero, another way to write that is log of the ratio of the probabilities. So the log ratio uh, is bounded by epsilon. And so that is exactly what the first of these images show, where, you know, I have the two distributions uh, under this randomized algorithm of the output. And I can sort of show that the distributions are close, but they're far, they're somewhat, there's some sort of lower bound also on, on their deviation. And the delta, uh, the uh, assumption is delta is supposed to be uh, cryptographically small. Um, sorry, I just saw this question. And the way it do is to, yeah, you should, yeah. Say, you, you should say that out loud, actually, if you don't. Sorry, <laughs> and the way, and the question is, and the way to do that is to add data to the set that sort of, sort of balances the impact of the sense that guy going out to keep the same. Yeah, so you add noise, as Alistair said, um, but it's also meant to be sort of post-processing invariant. So someone could keep making queries on the same data set, but like, because there's enough noise, they can't do better than that, something related to that size of noise. And so this epsilon and delta, quantify that amount of noise that is there. Delta is supposed to be thought of as cryptographically small. So you should think of that as like Shaw collision probability. Um, epsilon can be large and I think in practice is, is larger than people want it to be. Uh, and a lot of the Apple, uh, I, I don't know if any of you have seen these, uh, the Apple child uh, deep fake thing. So, so those things people found that effect, you know, Apple was supposed to like be doing this private machine learning to classify child porn or something. And that's a differentially private algorithm, but turned out their epsilon was gigantic. And so that's why people were able to infer, uh, to, to how the algorithm worked and stuff. So anyway, th this stuff is used in practice. So, uh, <laughs> that, that being said, uh, I'm not sure that the people implementing it know what epsilon and delta are. <laughs> okay, so this gets to this point about noise. Ideally, we say, hey, we have function f, we have some privacy parameters, we have a data set, and we're gonna output, say, the mean of the function, expectation of the function over the data set. So can we do this in a generic way? Um, Yes, but sort of only if we can bound the global variation of the function over all its inputs. Um, and what that means, we'll, we'll talk about right now. So the Laplace, Laplace and Gaussian mechanisms. So Laplace distribution, um, if you're not familiar, it's just an exponential distribution that's symmetrized. So it's, e, it's, it's you know, this distribution. Um, uh, so define delta f uh, to be the uh, to be the sort of maximum over all neighboring uh, data sets of the difference of the function. So in the case of the person with uh, height seven foot, 
this maximum would be sort of the difference of the average with the person included versus not. Um, we take in our data and now we add noise. So this, this is uh, to Alistair's point uh, earlier. We add noise to each data point with, for, and this IID that is from a Laplace distribution with this parameter where it depends on the global variation. And now return the expect, like the average of F evaluated at the data points with noise added. And that achieves epsilon delta, epsilon differential privacy. Um, if you want to do something with a Gaussian instead, the Gaussian has, you know, sorry, I know I look like I'm doing yoga on screen, but it's, uh, it's like a much, much faster decaying tail. Uh, and that only will achieve epsilon delta differential privacy because the differential privacy definition has a single exponential in it. And so, so of course, anything that's decaying faster than that will have some, will end up having some delta uh, asymptotically. The other mechanism uh, is called the exponential mechanism. Uh, and it, you could think of it as effectively like a Gibbs sampling mechanism and you can get different privacy, but we won't talk too much about it because we don't use it. The most important thing about differential privacy, and I think in cryptocurrency applications, this is the reason differential privacy is sort of, in some ways, preferable, uh, uh, you know, as a mechanism, is that differential privacy has this sort of semi-ring of operations. It has the sequential composition law of if I take a, a differential private algorithm with, uh, with parameter epsilon, I apply it to a data set, take the output of the algorithm, apply it to another differentially private algorithm with epsilon two, dot, dot, dot. Uh, I get to say that the uh, uh, combination uh, composes and still has differential privacy, but now with the sum of the, um, the sum of the epsilons. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a parallel composition law, which is if they're sort of independent queries uh, running on the same data set, possibly, uh, we, we get sort of the worst case uh, law. And so that's like sort of, that's why this is sort of, you could run many queries in parallel, they're independent in some sense, or you could run them sequentially, but you can always kind of continually keep them differentially private. Uh, Which um, given this, and this is why delta needs to be cryptographically negligible because yes, otherwise yes. you would have a significant delta term here. Yeah. Yes, although um, there is a, a kind of famous paper by Kairu So 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 and um, uh, Vishwanathan in 2016 that shows you it actually the delta dependence is actually not a sublinear, uh, like uh, it's okay. actually a little better than the epsilon dependence. Um, kind of unintuitively, it's it's very it's it's like an information theoretic proof that you get that it's completely not like a geometric thing. Um, but yeah, cool. Well, one question you might say is global sensitivity sucks, right? Because you could be just adding more noise than any value in your data set, <laughs> or like very close to that, you know, the maximum value for data set. So then, like, what's the point? Um, well, hey, why don't we try something simpler? Why don't we just localize? Given a certain data set, only add an amount of noise based on its neighbors instead of globally over all the possible pairs. And you, you might make this thing called local sensitivity, which given a data point X, you only look at the maximum deviation over its neighbors and add that much noise. And the global sensitivity is related kind of, kind of as you might expect. Bad news, this doesn't work. Good news is there is a way to bootstrap something that does work called smooth sensitivity. Won't go into too many details about it, but it's it's actually, I think, one of the most underused things I've observed. And you know, I've only learned about differential privacy over the last six months, but probably I'd say one of the bigger things in differential privacy, because it lets you kind of like make your amount of noise very instance specific, and it gives you a kind of black box algorithm for doing it. Um, and so use that. What, what do you mean by a neighbor here? Right. So 
a neighbor here means any two data sets that are distance less than or equal to one. Um, the, not, the intuitive oh. definition is this, yeah. Uh, the intuitive definition is, is like I add or remove a data point or I like change a data point, but only a, you know, by a certain amount. But the choice of metric is quite important. And we choose a certain metric for, uh, cur for CFMMs. But if you remember, um, the way we define curvature is actually an L1 norm. It's an L1 Lipschitz bound. So that we end up using L1. But yeah, that's a good question. Smooth sensitivity also, one important part, is the original definition and sort of industry around differential privacy was built around this sort of, I have a database, I remove or add an entry and like now you, know, you want it still to be private. Smooth sensitivity, the beauty of it is it actually lets you choose a metric and that metric can be uh, the L1 norm. It could be this kind of L0 norm, like difference between these things. It could be L2, it could be whatever metric you want. And given the metric, you can get, a no you can basically get this kind of local sensitivity measure of like how much noise to add given a set of data points. Um, so the reason I even mentioned this is like, we use this L1 norm, hence we can't just use like Hamming distance results. And so the smooth sensitivity is a really nice embedding theorem for this sort of stuff. All right, finally, after an hour of background, <laughs> we can actually get to the real result. Okay, don't worry, I, I, I don't, uh, this part's actually kind of short. So let phi be a kappa liquid and mu stable uh, trading function, processing a sequence of trades. If we have a verifiable source of randomness, then we can achieve mu log n little of one delta differential of privacy. To do this, we need three types of distributions, samples from distributions, uh, from the verifiable random function. And also we need to make sure these samples don't leak much data. Uh, like we, they don't leak data about their parameters in some sense. And that's a sort of technical nuance detail that can be implemented. Um, so we need a Laplace distribution sample. We need a random permutation from the uniform distribution of a symmetric group. And then we need a Dirichlet sample. So the Dirichlet distribution is a distribution on the probability simplex. It's the unique unimodal distribution um, that you can construct, uh, sorry, unique unimodal distribution that's consistent uh, over taking slices. And so backing up for a second, the probability simplex is the set of probability distributions over n elements. So it's the set of vectors uh, of length n who sum to one and every element is positive. The Dirichlet distribution is a distribution you can construct on that such that if I take any conditional distribution, so I, let's say I have n elements, I condition that the last element never happens. The conditional distributions also are all unimodal. And there's, a, there's amazing theorems about them and Dirichlet distributions, you know, one of the most famed, one of the most beloved things in classical frequentist statistics. Uh, somewhat beloved in Bayesian statistics, although there are some very bad impossibility results by uh, by uh, Diaconis and Friedman in 1986 or seven. Okay, so how do we actually prove differential privacy? I'm not gonna really go into all the details, but I'm gonna give the broad strokes geometric intuition. So what we do is we construct this, this uh, tree, and we'll see a picture of it in a second, called the trade tree. And the trade tree is made from partial sums uh, of the form given a permutation, sigma, we look at the partial sums of the difference between the permuted trade and the real trade uh, modified by uh, the curvature ratio. Um, so intuitively, if, we, if the curvature ratio is one, like this, you know, the impact function is uh, sort of like quadratic or something like that. The, uh, the, this sum is just the difference between the trade. So let's say I have trades one, two, and three. I permute it to three, two, and one. The partial sum would be like 
partial sum one would be the difference in size between trade one and three. Partial sum two would be trade one and three plus trade two and two, which is zero. Partial sum four would be trade one and three again. And the idea is this measures sort of the notion of discrepancy when I permute the trade order. So if we go back to that example of uh, all ones and then one trade of size t, um, by permuting it, uh, you know, most of the, these elements will be zero if, if mu and kappa are one. But then the one trade where, it, where the whale trade gets moved will be large. And so that's sort of a notion of like, hey, we can identify the whale trade. Um, and we construct the tree by making a binary heap generated by these row i. OK, so let's look at what this looks like geometrically. <clears throat> So here we have a trade tree, and uh, you know we, you know, these partial sums get inserted, and this gives you a sort of ordering. Um, one thing to 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 realize is that this definition actually bounds the price impact, um, and so what you can show is that the maximum price impact after you permute the trades is bounded by the the root element of the tree given a specific permutation in trades, plus the max discrepancy times the height. So now we actually have a very like geometric way of thinking about given the set of trades, what's the price impact? And we have sort of some coarse bounds which are, are actually easier to work with. Um, so one thing that's interesting is, is, okay, so now we can take the expectation of a random permutation. So given you know, my verifiable random function, draws a random permutation, I randomly permute the trades, what's the expected price impact of the worst case price impact on average overall permutation? I, I mean, it, it, it gives you the distribution of the price impact as well, doesn't it? It's not just the worst case, yes. it gives you all the information you need about that. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Uh, and yeah, this tree structure is actually the, the key thing here because what you then show is you say, okay, let's pretend to start, this is a desert data that the first element, the expected value of that is constant. And the second part has height log n. So like the tree is balanced. Then we know the price impact is, is now O of log n. Um, and that basically is exponentially better than batching. Remember in batching, the worst case was we had this linear impact cost. In, in, in a when when we have this kind of whale trade and minnow trade today. But here we actually can get it to be uh, logarithmic if we can ensure these are true. And the beauty is that we can we can kind of ensure these are true by doing two things. One, adding Laplace noise um, that separates the trades so that they're sort of not all if they're so intuitively the reason there's some technical reasons why you have to add noise, but the intuition is let's get back to that scenario of like one trade of size t, t minus one trades of size one. If I randomly permute that set, there are much fewer than n factorial output uh, sequences because all the ones are the same, right? So it, 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 you've actually lost, you don't have the true amount of entropy that you'd have if you actually permuted them. But by adding noise, you actually make it such that. You, you can regain unique sequences. And um, a very important fact, and, and many of you might remember this from like, I don't know, CS 101, or is that like you, you kind of learned this like recursion for why quicksort has expected log n time. What you don't know is quicksort has one of the best, like random quicksort corresponds to drawing a random permutation and generating a random binary tree from that permutation where you, you, know, you pick a pivot, pick left and right, pick left and right, dot, dot, dot. And you can show that that random binary tree has extremely strong concentration bounds around log n. Not only is its concentration bounds aren't like log n plus or minus square root of log n. The concentration bounds are log n plus four times log n. So as n goes to infinity of your list, quicksort actually can never take more than four log n time. Extremely strong concentration bounds. So that's what we take an advantage of to guarantee this tree actually has height log n. And the other thing we have to do is split trades. Um, and the way to do that, draw a distribution from the Dirichlet, 
split the trades. The Dirichlet at least ensures there's some noise in the trade size, again, in, in how you split them. Um, and then, you know, we choose n in some appropriate way to match epsilon delta. Okay. Is this combination differentially private? And the answer is yes, because we have all these composition laws. Uh, and so, yeah, basically you can get that, this result that is mu log n differentially private. Um, and one thing that's kind of a weird technical nuance is the Dirichlet sampling itself needs to be done privately because you don't want to exactly leak the parameter. Um, and you can, it turns out you can do that pretty easily. Uh, the simple answer is Dirichlet's are sub-Gaussian. I mean, they're on, bound on a compact domain, so pretty easy to be sub-Gaussian. Uh, but that lets you use all these kind of sub-Gaussian tail inequalities. All right, so we're almost at the end, which is the last two slides. Uh, can we do better? Um, well, so I got the idea for this trade tree thing from uh, the online learning literature where there's a, uh, a, a, an analog of VC dimension. So if, if you're familiar with statistical learning theory, VC dimension is sort of a very coarse way of measuring sample complexity. Like how many samples does my learning algorithm need to get error less than some fixed amount with high probability? Uh, and there's another notion for online learning algorithms where you're given where the sequence of your data matters, not the whole data set, uh, called Littlestone dimension. And Littlestone dimension has to do with constructing trees. And I try to basically construct this tree based on getting a finite Littlestone dimension, which is how this kind of very, the papers I was saying are kind of remarkable, were proved. Yeah. And the state of the art online learning DP results, this kind of like duality theorem result show that the black box learning algorithms can only really do to the to the D where D is a little dimension. Um, and so that sort of says, you could kind of think of that as like sort of being not a great result of like, hey, there might not be that much better you can do than permuting, splitting, and adding noise. Unless you're at zero curvature. So at zero curvature, all bets are off. You need completely different theorem. Um, Sorry, and what's there's N one here? natural question. Oh, sorry. Uh, what is n here? Uh, n is the number of trades you you want okay. to make private. Cool. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I I use t and n interchangeably, but yeah, it's it's number of trades. Uh, and the last question is, you know, we kind of ignored this issue and and I didn't really say it in this presentation, but the way we used curvature assumes the feeless regime. So you might be like, hey, well, that's not realistic. Uniswap charges 30 basis points. Um, fees actually help uh, a little bit. They actually mean with fees, you get to add less noise, uh, it turns out. Um, but you, you might be like, oh, can we really analyze these trade trees this way? Uh, and if you thought that, you know, correct, you can't analyze it the way we analyze it. but there's this amazing line of literature on metric embeddings of trees and bounding worst case algorithm performance using generic chaining uh, that I'm, you know, it's in the appendix of this, but we kind of give some of the steps of how you get there. Um, Did you just say that with fees, you would need less noise or less trades? Yes. No, Why? you don't have to add as much noise. Okay. So the yeah, fees separate. The fees separate the, they kind of like push the trading function further. And so one of the reasons for that, that if you write out the math is the, the impact function with fees is actually one minus the fee times the impact function. So let's say I have the impact function with no fees. Uh, here, I'll, I'll write it in here. Uh, and, you know, Basically, the, the, the fee kind of pushes things a little further apart. Like you don't need to separate the trades as much because the fee sort of implicitly adds change the curvature of the trading function. That's kind of like, it's Isn't like a it weird just thing. Isn't proportional but... to the amounts always though? So like, wouldn't, you st wouldn't it sort of reflect the same 
So, so remember this, the, the sequence in which you, you evaluate the trades matters, right? So let's have a trade of size one, trade of size three, trade of size two. I'm randomly permuting them. Maybe it, I do two, three, one, or I do three, one, two. Um, with fees, the kind of like the, the deviation, it, the sort of deviation that you get kind of separates slightly more than it does if they were all this, if there was no fee. Um, I, I don't know exactly how to, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I'll send the slides also. The references are in the, uh, there. Sounds good. But yeah, it, it's kind of like a weird, re the fees are a little bit annoying to handle, but I think you can definitely, can definitely handle it. Um, the other thing is all of the stuff I've said here can be evaluated numerically. And so one of the future, you know, future work is actually just numerically at, permuting, splitting, and uh, like, you know, implement the differentially private algorithm, implement the normal algorithm, sample sequences of trades, and like look at the empirical price impact and uh, privacy. Uh, and just like, because because these are very, you know, Guillermo was, you know, chiding me was like, these are just like horrible constants hidden in all, it's hidden in all these proofs. Uh, and in practice, they're probably way better. And it's also really easy to implement. So, uh, you know, hopefully you see that like in a blockchain, this would actually be easy to implement if you have a VRF that a smart contract can use. Um, because then it, the application itself can draw a random permutation given the entropy, it can draw from the Dirichlet and it can draw Laplace and then add it. Um, and so, that's sort of like why, you know, I think this, this stuff is, I, the bounds we have here are probably quite pessimistic relative to reality, um, which is sort of future work. And one other question is like, given that this sort of prevents front or like makes front running harder, there's sort of a sense in which this should also classify cost of MEV prevention versus PN, like max profit that someone gets from MEV. And so, uh, future work is kind of generalizing this to other, that scenario, not just AMM. Cool. Uh, questions, but uh, these are the references in case anyone, but I'll, I'll send them. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking we should probably get your slides and we can link them ideally from the YouTube. And there's a lot of comments this time around. So just thinking this Alex, we might want to try to get some of these also into the YouTube video for after. Yeah. So Tarun, if you want to send me the slides, I'll put them up on SlideShare and we'll link them in the, in the, uh, in the notes for the video. And I'll make sure to download these. Yeah. I'll just send them in the Telegram right now. Okay. Perfect. Even easier. But yeah, I guess if there's any other questions, now would be a good time. Is it kosher for me to ask a question? I don't know. Is that against the rules? <laughs> I think it's totally okay. <laughs> Go for All right. it. You'll forgive me. Um, so, Tarun, I just want to get back to this thing about fees, and and I, I know we you know, we've been mostly thinking yeah. about the fee free world. So I, I don't mean to throw a curveball because I genuinely don't know the answer. Um, but maybe we can brainstorm it. It's this idea that right with fees because of path deficiency, which for everybody's interest is a property. Uh, Tarun and Guillermo described in a previous paper. Um, <coughs> that essentially, right, you, you could imagine a CFMM without fees. And if you have a hundred trades of size one or one size, one trade of size a hundred, then those two things look the same in the absence of fees, um, right? In terms of, in terms of the final reserve composition, that is very much not the case in the case of fees um, for actually splitting up your trade results in strictly worse execution. Uh, now that means of course that in these cases where you're trying to discern a large trade, you might be able to do better in a world with fees than otherwise. At least that would be my first intuition. Uh, do you think that's wrong? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I guess that's what I was saying, kind of trying to say is that I, I actually think fees mean you can use less entropy. But I, I think- What's the intuition for that? The precise ordering, so uh, the, the dumbest intuition is in the fee list case, it's path independent. Um, 
which means that the beginning and end price are always the same, regardless of the order of the permutation. But in the fee case, it's not. And that the max mm. deviation, there's a distribution of outcomes for the last price, which is some excess, you get some free entropy there, dependent on your sequence of trades. So you sort of, if you were making a randomness extractor from this, it would, should need less bits. That would be like the way I'd try to formalize it. But it's not like, yeah, I, it's, it's still a little bit hazy. And, but I think that's in, in my mind what Alex's intuition also is, maybe. Right, it's, I mean, I, I could sort of <coughs> argue it both ways, right? No, I, that makes perfect sense to me. What also makes perfect sense to me is to say you might actually need more uh, exactly because you can infer something about the underlying trades potentially because the final price is dependent on the ordering in a way that it is not in the case without fees. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know the answer. And I honestly think you'll get a better idea from like empirically trying to do something like take certain se planted sequences that you can come up with an adversarial model for, like I was saying with the online learning thing, and try to see how well you can like try to come up with some measure of entropy mm -hmm. and also some like simple attacks and see numerically their probability of success. That's probably right. Um, what I find very interesting, right, in this in this framework is that in some sense, certainly in the case with fees, where you're splitting up trades and doing permutations, the payoffs to the liquidity provider are going to be different because, right, the trader's paying more, but who's getting that excess? It's the liquidity provider. So in a certain sense, you are paying the liquidity provider for more privacy. Uh, actually, there's a very, there's an interesting point to this, which is um, we wrote a, our paper that is on curvature, which defined this kind of like this idea, like why you just form a curvature. The slide I had missing, uh, one of the things that actually I, I should have mentioned is that you can actually show that liquidity providers are never profitable if there's no noise trading. Um, Basically, you need people who are trading back and forth kind of randomly in some sense. And the adding in privacy actually ensures LPs are closer to profitable or profitable. So there's a weird sense in which what you're doing here is take charging a fee from the trader and giving it to the liquidity provider. Um, and like it could actually weirdly stabilize some of these markets in some cases. Uh, but it's like, you know, that sort of another weird thing. Uh, can we bound, sorry, Darius, how can we yeah. bound? Yeah, go for it. Um, uh, so you said it, uh, fees could potentially make things worse. Um, you haven't analyzed it yet, but could yeah. we bound how much worse it could get um, for privacy based on the ratio between the fee amounts and the trade amounts? So, so let's say fees are never more than a hundredth of a trade amount. Okay, can we then use that to say something about Privacy. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. So that's that's sort of what this uh, the the that we kind of it, it is kind of addressed in the appendix, uh, but it's like not okay. it's not I, I only for Uniswap. So I don't think it's <clears throat> easy to write that out for generic constant function market makers, but for certain functional forms, you can write out exactly that relation. Um, so the last appendix in this paper, appendix I, I think has. The Uniswap calculation for that. Um, okay, uh, thank you. I think I saw I mean, you on you, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't. So, in the case where the fee is really small, right, all of these bounds apply. So, all of these weird, you know, liquidity sensitivity bounds do apply. And as long as there's kind of some amount of noise in the trades, you can make very similar arguments. Um, they don't carry over directly, though, which is why the proof actually has like a few more. Like it, it, it would take some amount of, of, of careful sleuthing to actually make sure that it does work. But in some sense, the very small fee case in the case with no fees is, is almost the same when you have even just a little bit of like random noise. It is not the same in the mm -hmm. case where you have like infinitely many digits of position because you know you, you can tell apart the exact ordering in which trades happen and things like that. But you can imagine that like, you know, mm -hmm. if, look, if, if if adding fees only affects you in the third or fourth significant digit, right? Then, then it's not going to matter if your noise is on the order of two digits, or, or sorry, you know, two to two decimal places out or something. I see. Right. That's that's kind of the intuition. 
Um, but it's it's very not obvious, and and to me, it's certainly not obvious uh, whether fees actually hurt or help in terms of getting the um, in terms of actually like giving you privacy, better privacy results. Yeah, I, I think the the focus, at least that uh, you know, the direction I guess suggested in the appendix is take the fee-less case, take the fee case, try to show that there's only a, there's a bound between the two of them. That's what these chaining type type of arguments show you is that they're never more than this distance apart. Yeah, that, that was render. that was the intuition behind my question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so the thing is it does depend on the function a lot more new in a nuanced way, unlike these curvature bounds, which are like these like very coarse linear upper and lower bounds. So that that's why I don't think there's like a generic answer, or at least like we don't have a generic answer for that. But that's why I think the numerical simulations of this are like the best way to kind of get some intuition for it. Because like, again, Guillermo's intuition is that like, we're kind of, this is still quite suboptimal, like information theoretically, like we, we could probably get away with way less entropy. Um, and it might not be just from the fees type of thing. It, like you, you might be able to get away with fewer calls to the verifiable random function. So, so that, that's the question. Um, how much ent entropy in practice do you need? So, so pick some yeah. and, um, yeah. Uh, we don't, we don't know. I mean, that, that's why I said, I think you can, <laughs> uh, the, best, the best way to do, a lot of these differential privacy studies that people do, um, they usually prove a theorem with terrible bounds like this, like terrible constants. Mm -hmm. um, and then they do numerical simulations and like show how close the two are. And then they try to like extract some notion of entropy. Okay. Yeah, it, it's really hard because the problem with entropy bounds is that they're actually really bad, right? I mean, fundamentally, right? You're assuming your adversary can do any function, not even just like computable functions or even functions that are like efficient, right? Like they are like, NSA level adverse. I mean, it's even worse than the NSA because they even have like unlimited computation, right? It's like any measurable function can be your algorithm and all this stuff. So, and, and, and tropic bounds generic there are quite bad because entropy doesn't really compose in a way that's like super nice. Um, it composes a little bit. And so you, you get the same asymptotics, but you don't really get constants. So the usual methods that we use for proving things are just like, you know, you take, take some, some mechanism, you have some you know, amount of privacy in this mechanism and you add more noise to add more privacy. And so it kind of screws up, you know, the, the whole pipeline ends up like totally screwing up with a screwing with a constants and like all of this thing. And so you, it's this weird, um, I, I want to call it like essentially an academic exercise in a lot of ways. I mean, again, if you look at the Apple and Google stuff, it's like kind of silly. Um, but the TLDR is that you can say that these things are, are private. And in fact, in practice, you choose the right constants, which are going to be much better than those in theory you could probably get good privacy but even in practice people don't actually do this uh, which is kind of funny all at once so um, but the point is like I think entropy is, is one of those things that's really it's rather complicated because it, it gives you it gives your adversary kind of essentially unlimited power with the given data and it's really really hard to like have good guarantees in that case um, yeah one so thing what, what kind of additional assumptions might you have to make in order to get those constants down? Well, I think that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Is like, what's a good framework that essentially is not entropic that gives you, you know, reasonable privacy guarantees? Uh, there's a whole there, philosophical debate there's a, there's, about what it means. There's a, there's a thing that seems to be very popular in the differential privacy literature now, which is like, correlated differential privacy, which gives you information theoretic bounds, but they're like local something. Uh, but like, yeah, I, I think like the problem is these like metric entropy type of things are always extremely sharp because of like a very small subset of cases. It's kind of a little bit like SAT problems where mm. there's the, the number of worst case uh, uh, instances is actually extremely small, but the worst case instances dominate your average if that makes sense. Mm. Uh, yeah. And so that's that it, it's kind of hard to exactly do that to get that. But I, I do I do think like you, you, you might be able to get something. Um, but I think what's better in practice is just like implement it and then see what see how it looks like that's, that's the easiest way. Yeah, that I agree. With. Uh, and, and, and to the point of smart contract languages, uh, I just don't see I, 
to anyone developing one, I feel like, or like making an API, I think actually providing like a probability, like numpy.random, but for like the VRF of like, hey, my smart contract wants a sample from a Gaussian using the VRF and I want the certificate from the VRF um, would be awesome. Uh, also useful for some post-quantum crypto algorithms. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of stuff like this that will, you know, if you want to make privacy useful in like DeFi, uh, I think you kind of have to like provide the APIs to like sample random numbers to developers. Because otherwise, like, yeah, it, 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 I think it's going to be hard for them to like write their own, you know, it's like, it's, it's basically they need some verifiable randomness. And like, if they have to go through your consensus protocol to like dig out like the VRF hash, that's not ideal. Awesome. So I think uh, we're about out of time this morning. I know folks got to run to um, to some other events, but uh, hey, Tarun, thank you very much for uh, for the presentation. The slides were great. Yeah, if you want to send them on Telegram, I'll put them up later. And uh, thanks yep. to everyone who attended. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you all next time.